All right, people, we're gonna do something a little different today. We're, we're not doing a hand breakdown. You know, we're not doing a vlog. We're gonna specifically do, I don't know if you wanna call it a lecture, a lesson, a thought about check raising the flop. Is it back, right? It was out of vogue for a while. Is it back? That's the question. We're gonna go over the history of it, you know, um, in terms of like how people used to play spots like this. We're gonna go over sizing and what to do when you are check raising and how to play against somebody who is tough, who check raises flop lots. We're gonna get through all of it. Um, first, I wanted to sort of uh, reference limit hold'em, okay? In limit hold'em, check raising is incredibly common. It's a, it's a utilized weapon all the time. Like in limit, you're playing super aggro, you know? You're check raising middle pair to bet, bet for value. You know, you're check raising top pair almost always. You're just going boom, 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 how many bets can I put in, right? But in no limit hold'em, um, generally speaking, you know, you don't see that. You, you see a, a different approach, um, mainly with the idea being like pot control, right? Because in no limit, you know, you can lose all your chips in one in one, one fell swoop. Now, in the old days, this was an advantage for the Duel Brunsons of the world, people like myself who played this sort of small ball style, which would play bust them hands against the group of people that overplayed top pair. You know, like on King 6-5, they had King Queen, they would like, they would check raise bet bet in order to, or check raise bet in, big too, in order to protect their hand. You know, not really find out where they're at, but you know, yeah, yeah, you don't want any card to come off. There was like a fear of that, right? So I think there was a period in tournament poker specifically where, you know, um, people were check raising too much in no limit, okay? Then I came around, not just me, but others with this sort of small ball approach, a little more pot control -y, and you started to see people learn that, well, top pair is just a pair. Okay, and if I want to play like a big, big pot here, might not be quite enough to, you know, to, to, to want to play a big pot. So part of the thing with check raising is this, when you check raise, you're always out of position, right? And when you check raise and your opponent plays, you're bloating the pot. So you're making the pot bigger, which could lead to very uncomfortable decisions on turn and river. So that's basic premise for why people kind of gutted that from their play. I'd say for the last, up until, about a year ago, you just didn't see it in No Limit, hardly ever on flops, unless people were just check jamming or something like that. But you just didn't see a lot of check raising. Now, one of the other sort of advancements in poker is bet sizing, right? Part of the reason maybe people didn't check raise as much in the past six years too was, you know, let's say six years ago, seven years ago, if people are betting two thirds pot on the flop, well, check raising is a big percentage of, of, of the pot. Now, you see people with a lot of their range bet 25% of pot. Right? So that's a very limit hold to me kind of bet. So what we've seen since then is a lot more attacking that continuation bet. I'm talking mainly at higher stakes. So listen, if this isn't true in the small games you play, eh, what can I tell you? It's, it's happening at the higher stakes and usually what happens to higher stakes does trickle down. And I definitely have noticed a lot more of a, a little bit more of an attacking style against the check races. So another reason, another very important reason why really just check calling with top pair in certain spots makes more sense is you're protecting your check call range. So what exactly does that mean? Well, so let's say on the flop, if you check raise all your top pair or better and a couple bluffs here and there, when you check call, you're naked on the turn. Your opponent knows what you cannot have. You can't have a set, you can't have two pair, you can't have top pair. So that makes you naked on the turn. Your range is vulnerable to a double barrel when people start picking this up. Obviously, if they don't realize you're doing this, only check raising, like always check raising your best hands, then it still can be a viable strategy. But once they start to figure out, man, every time they check raise, they have it. So what does that mean when you check call? It means you have a mediocre hand and good players will pick up on that and they will abuse it. So like an example, let's say you defended the big line with King Jack against the middle position player and the flop comes King, Deuce, Three, Rainbow. You know, you check, but you're always gonna do here. You never should bet here, okay, period. There's just no planet where that makes sense. I mean, maybe, I don't know. Listen, I don't like to poo-poo any ideas and if you have one that you think makes sense, it probably doesn't, but okay, I'll concede. So when you check and your opponent c-bets this flop a lot, right? King, deuce, three, it's a one big, two little type texture, which means the preflop raiser is gonna c-bet a very high frequency here with his entire range. So when he does that and you have king, jack, you know, historically, people just check call, okay? We're starting to see some people check raising this spot now um, for value, um, which is a little bit thin, but you know, people are more aggressive and you know, the good players are calling a little more light in these spots too. So um, the hard part about check raising 
if you're going to do it in what you consider more of a polar way, where you're just check raising your best hands and your bluffs, then sometimes you just don't have enough of the best hands. Like what's a really good hand on king, deuce, three from the big blind? Pocket deuces, pocket threes, king, three, king, deuce. It's not a ton of combos. If you start adding king, queen, and king, jack, well, now you've got a lot more opportunity to be check raised bluffing as well with your, you know, five, six off suits and your ace, five offs and things like that, which is kind of like a semi bluff anyway with the ace five because ace high could still be the best hand. All right, so when should you check raise? And I will say this, if you're gonna choose opponents, you generally want to check raise opponents who are weaker, who C bet as they do because they learn that they watch, you know, they they learn. Okay, I raise before the flop. I got a C bet, but they're weak and they don't fight for pots and they fit or fold, if you will. Like that used to be a saying in poker. You know, fit or fold. If you don't fit the flop, just fold. Those are the kind of people you want to check raise bluff more often, right? Um, you also want to check raise more against players who don't necessarily always double and triple barrel. If you're up against sort of a pot control-y type player, and let's say you do flop a big hand, or even whenever, just even with your bluffs, but when you do flop a big hand, what will often happen is, you know, you check call the flop, you check turn, they check back. And they might check back some top pair hands and, you know, be worried about some stuff, or just in general trying to keep the pot smaller. So one way to make sure you get it in when you have the best hand against these types of players is to just go ahead and check, raise, flop, bet, turn, bet, river, right? Um, that's against players that just don't bluff that much either, right? If you have a player who's gonna like bluff a lot, like aggressive players, then you wanna have a much a much stronger check call range on the flop so that they will fire the second barrel and maybe the third, depending on what card comes. But again, that's all about understanding player types, right? Against the weaker passive player, you know, check, raise your value more, okay? Just check, raise, period, more, okay? against more aggressive players, set some more traps, take advantage of their tendencies to you know, bet turn and river too often, which is the exact opposite of what the weak players do. So the weak players, we're just gonna try to hope we cool them, if you will, you know, hope that they have a hand like king, queen and be like, well, nothing I could do. Even when you check, raise, flop, bet big on turn and jam river, king, queen's never any good. They're just think, oh, unlucky, right? All right, so the question here is, if you're gonna check raise, right? What should go through your head about why? Well, we sort of already touched on one thing, which is opponent's tendencies. You know, how do they play? What type of player are they? Will they overfold on the flop to a check raise? Um, and you know, the other things we said about whether they double and triple barrel. So that's one number one thing. The second one is flop texture and then combining that with the uh, stack depth, right? So now what you have to figure out too is on what flops, what sizes should be used and against two, right? Again, against weaker players who are overfolding, you can get away with check raising much smaller sizes. They're not gonna fight for these pots. Whereas good players against very small sizes, they're gonna put you in some tough spots on some turn cards where they just peel, right? So things to consider are flop texture. Obviously, um, a more dynamic flop texture allows for bigger raises. So let's say on nine, eight, six with two hearts, you can check raise really big on that board with a wide range of hands, both draws and strong hands. Now, if the flop comes king, deuce, deuce, that's not one that makes a lot of sense to check raise big. So be mindful of the sort of, um, you know, types of flops that you can encounter and then think about your sizes in terms of how they should be uh, explo explored based on, you know, the dynamicness of the board, how wet it is, how wet it is. <laughs> it's weird even saying that, you know what I'm saying? All right, so that's things to be thinking about in terms of how big you should raise flop texture um, and also stack depth too, right? Like you sometimes, you know, on a nine, eight, six, if, you know, if it's close, if a check raise is basically committing you pretty much, you can just jam, you know, in a lot of those spots. Now the question is, how do we deal with somebody who's check raising us a lot? Okay, well, you are gonna encounter some players who are overdoing it, you know, and they check raise a lot and they put you in tough spots. So what is the exploit against that player? Give you five seconds. What would you do against the player who check raises way too much? Well, if you came up with check raise less often, you got the right answer. Okay, I'm mean, sorry, bet less often, C bet less often. Just lower your C bet percentage. Even though Solver says this is a 100% auto C bet, whatever, it doesn't mean you have to listen and it doesn't mean you can't exploit your opponents who do that. Uh, especially, and again, this is something you generally um, want to add to your repertoire against very good players, frankly. And, you know, checking back on some boards that uh, maybe favor them. And generally, a lot of the times when you're seeing check raising happen, you're seeing it from the big blind, okay? Why that's important is because the big blind can represent 
a really wide range of hands, okay? Not as much, you know, the ace, king, aces, kings hands if they did in three bet preflop, um, but more so, you know, on the six, six, nine boards and things like that, they're gonna defend really, you know, with a lot more six X in their range than you're probably opening with in those spots. So against really good players on those boards, um, you know, you have to, you, you, you can actually think about, you know, just playing pure more value in those spots like where they check raise, you kind of want them to, and you're happy about it. And then, you know, if you feel like you're going to get blown off some equity with some marginal hands and be in some tough spots, maybe you check those back. So for example, maybe against the good player who uh, defends his big blind, it comes king five, four, which maybe is supposed to be a C bet always. We have jacks. Okay. You don't necessarily want to C bet, get check raised. Now what? You can't really fold. So now the turn card is a 10. He bets again. What now? It's, you know, so... In order to avoid that problem, you can just check back the flop sometimes with hands like jacks. Again, with jacks too, you're not really worried too much about a free card. There's only a queen and an ace available as an overcard, and if it comes, you'll see it. It's not hidden. Now, one of the other things you might have thought was an idea to, do, to deal with people who check raise too much is the three bet flops. And I will say it's not much of a thing, really, okay? If you're gonna be three betting flop, it's usually in a spot where the stack to pot ratio is so low that you're just jamming. You're jamming with your high equity hands, your bluffs, your draws, that kind of stuff. But, you know, this the limit hold and play, when you get check raised with three bets so you can take the free card on the turn, that's not as much of a thing in no limit hold, okay? So I, you just don't see that a lot, whether that's in solver land or in the real world, right? And I like to talk about those two things separately because in solver land, you're playing against computers, right? So it's this fantasy land. It doesn't ex actually exist anywhere. Nobody's doing this. but. Then when you think about real life, like, you know, how do things apply or how are things different in that regard? And in this case, three betting the flop isn't really a thing in both Silverland and the real world. Okay, last thing I wanted to cover about check raising is one specific board we sort of touched down a little bit, and that's the low paired boards, okay? The 557, the 668, the 336, the 335, the, you know, 998, all these boards. Again, the higher card paired boards um, are relevant here too but the lower ones even more so, because again, when you see check raising happen, it's usually the big blind doing it. Almost always it's the big blind doing the check raising. So it, let's say, for example, you raised under the gun, okay? And the big blind calls and it comes seven, seven, eight. Well, big blind checks, you bet, okay? Well, you definitely have range advantage in that you have aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, nines, all that stuff, right? But in terms of like the top high end range, like nut, nut advantage, the big blind does, okay? So you have to balance that. Sure, you have, you know, range advantage overall, but on a board like that, your opponent's gonna have trips a lot more often than you will, simply because they're defending pretty much, you know, any two suited cards, small, whatever, like even off suit seven, six, seven, eight against min raises from under the gun and things like that. So now what you have to decide is fight or flight, okay? Are you gonna fight for these pots or are you going to just give up or wave the white flag or go for pot control? And again, how to make these decisions, I think, depends on who your opponent is, okay? I would say against weak, passive, predictable players, go ahead and bet, you know, with your king jacks, your queen queens, your ace tens, your ace jacks, always just bet because they will tell you what they have. You know, if they check raise, you know, okay, worst case scenario, they have like a straight draw whatever, you're not doing great against that, but they have trips just a lot. Now, contrast that with a very dynamic, bluffy, kind of good player. He's gonna check raise you there with a lot of bullshit. He's gonna check raise you, let's say he has king six suited and it comes seven, seven, eight, and there's one of his suit. He's gonna check raise you on that board, a lot, you know? More often than you might want when you have these vulnerable hands. So against players like that, maybe you look as an exploit of saying, okay, I'm not gonna fight for these pots. However, you could go the other way too. You can be like, all right, this guy's full of shit a lot. Now you ask yourself how much, how hard do you want to fight for these pots against these players? Because here's the thing. Um, if you become passive in these lines too much, you're just giving up a lot of equity where they just have Jack queen and or Jack 10 and they hit a pair on the turn and you might've won that with a C bet, right? So you give up a little bit of that. Um, sometimes when you check back on flop, now they just bet huge on turn and you just have to fold a lot. So it's not easy to play these spots especially against really good players. So you have to decide for yourself, 
on those boards, are you a fighter or you are, are you a flighter? <laughs> that's a word, right? You're either one that says, okay, you know what? Fuck you. I'm not going away, right? So what? Came 887, I got ace jack. I'm, ch- I'm calling your check raise. Then when a deuce comes on the turn and you bet big, I'm calling again. And then on the river, when the, when the brick hits, when a king hits, he bets it, I'm fucking calling you, right? Like you can be that guy. That's very, very dangerous leveling game to play. And generally speaking in tournaments, for the most part, unless you're playing super high stakes, you can find better spots, okay? Um, that's a theory, finding better spots that is much more applicable to the mid stakes and low stakes than it is high stakes, right? When we play high stakes poker, there aren't that many much better spots. They're all really good players. So you kind of just have to play great poker. That means you have to fight for on these paired boards as well. Sometimes you have to call really light. Sometimes you have to run some bluffs yourself. You know, you got to get in there and gamble. Um, but you know, uh, in the smaller buy-in tournaments, you know, maybe those are not boards against, let's say another big stack, good player in the big blind. Maybe those are ones you just want to, you know, take the passive route. So you decide for yourself, are you a fighter on these boards or are you not? Because you should be check raising yourself. Let's say, for example, you're the big blind, right? And you know, a, an aggressive player, or no, let's say, let's, let's go with predictable player, predictable st- type player raised from middle position. You defend with, like I said, king five suited and the flop comes, you know, four, four, six with one of your suit. You check, they bet raise, raise, right? Raise and find out. Like, cause you're gonna do that with your trips. You're gonna do that with your good hands. So do that with some of your bluffs. Now, if they call, okay, reassess. If they call and the turn card, let's say the turn card improves you. Let's say the turn is a seven of hearts, gives you flush draw. Now you can play this two ways. You could check raise again if you wanted. You could bet small. You can bet big. Um, you're gonna you're gonna choose your strategy based on what you think is gonna best benefit you against this specific type of player. Now let's say the seven of hearts comes and you bet two thirds pot. They called. Well, now you have a lot of outs because you've turned a lot. It's always better to have some sort of back door. Be wrapped around the trip card in some way, whether it's a three straight, three flush over card type situation. You want to have a little back door way of winning the pot when you you know when they fight. So now let's say the river you blank off, you have to decide, is this player someone who overfolds or overcalls in these spots? If you say like, okay, they probably have jacks, tens, queens, or something like that, are they gonna fold those hands? And if you don't think so, and you didn't improve, you just wave the white flag. You ran your check raise on the flop, you ran your turn bet, right? They called both spots, you know, you don't think they're gonna fold here, the jig is up. However, often when you do that, you check raise flop, hands over. Often when you do that, you check race flop that turn, hands over. When it's not, ask yourself why, what type of player. If you have a player who is capable of folding over pairs there, you can go huge on river, like really big. Like you can over bet, you know, you can bet one, like almost like one and a half times the pot, even you know, anywhere in that range, you can go really big against them to try to force them off the hand, right? Because again, let's say you have Kings against the big blind and it comes four, four, six. He check raised you, the turn's a seven, he bet big. River's a nine. He goes all in. You have kings. Who cares what you have? If he has what he says he has, you lose, right? So a lot of times people get married to the fact that they have an overpair, you know, and, and, and those are the ones you exploit a different way, but it's just the bluff catcher, right? It's almost the same as having like ace jack high in two kings. If you, if you assume it's a spot where your opponent's so polarized that they have trips, a straight, or a full house, right? Kings don't beat either of those hands, neither does ace jack high. So even when you think against a very good player that they might have aces or kings, this is a spot where you can check raise, turn the equity with the draw. I would say generally speaking, if you don't turn any equity, you're also gonna wanna incorporate some check raise, just check fold turn, right? So let's say you check raise the four, four, six with king five. Um, you know, he calls and the turn's like an ace. Yeah, maybe, oh no, let's not use an ace. Let's just say a queen of another suit that you don't have. Maybe this isn't one that, you know, like, this is one you can give up, giving your opponent credit. Again, it depends on what kind of fighter they are. Are they a fighter or a flighter? I would say one of the most valuable things you can do when you sit down at a poker table is ask yourself, look around the table and go, which one of these guys fights on paired boards, right? There was a time when Phil Ivey was playing online and he was crushing everybody heads up, but he was doing things that you're not supposed to do. He was check raising, I think someone said like 20% of flops. You know, he was putting people to the test, constantly being in your face, right? Um, you know, and he, you know, he dealt with that really well. So, uh, so yeah, you know, on these paired boards, part of the reasoning behind, you know, playing these paired boards aggressively too is, 
if your opponent didn't start with a pair and it comes six, six, four, they probably still don't have a pair. You know, their best case is ace highs. So again, have some equity, you know, pick your opponents wisely. I don't think you should randomize these in mid stakes or low stakes. I think that's really stupid. I think it's really dumb. Like if you're playing online, you know, and you don't have the benefit of seeing who you're up against or anything like that, then go ahead. You can choose a, you can choose a percentage where you check raise these flops with certain textures, with certain back doors or whatnot. And you can just let it, leave it up to chance, right? Or you can do like Jesse Lonis. This is one of my favorites. Lucky Chewy says, Jesse, do you randomize? Jesse looks over at him. Jesse's a high stakes crusher already. And he goes, fuck no, I can't afford to do that shit. I got kids. <laughs> Anyways, with that, I'll leave you. So I think the most important thing is ask yourself, are you a fighter or a flighter on these paired boards? Um, and I hope you took some things away from this. Uh, I'm doing a lot of different work towards the World Series on some different No Limit stuff. I'm taking in some of the different content that's out there just to see how my opponents think, how they're approaching different situations, what exploits they're using. So that benefits me when I'm up against them. But also I plan on when I'm done and I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run the gamut. I'm gonna do everything. I'm starting, I'm gonna try to do as much as I can, all tournament content. I started with Darren Elias's course uh, with Nick Petrangelo. Road to Victory, I believe it is. And we're going to move on. I'm going to cover the gamut. We're going to check out the chip leader coaching stuff. We'll do some poker coaching. Um, what else? We'll see. But we're going to cover the gamut. Anyways, hope you enjoyed that video. A little poker lesson on check raising the flop. Till next time.